Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. This morning I'm looking at a book which has come to us from uh, Wildy Simmons and Hill Publishing. It's an excellent book. They really do produce some really fascinating work, uh, really with their finger on the pulse of what's happening in the legal world, uh, with a, a variety of interesting titles. And this one is no different from the others that we have reviewed. The title of the book is Trials and Tribulations. It's got a subheading, Uncommon Tales of the Common Law, and it's been written by James Wilson. Uh, now, my wife and Elizabeth and I have talked about the book, and we gave it a title for our review, which will be on the web and in the journals, this title. Some great legal anecdotes welcomed at a time of change for the bench and the bar. Well, that's a fairly straightforward statement, you'd think. Well, we're going to have a look at the book. It's only a short one, first of all. My few little playing cards on the front there. That's the front. Then the uh, spine itself is there with the title. And then you've got a little, a couple of quotes about reviews. This is actually, these are reviews of a previous book, um, Wilson's Court and Bold, which again is an, an interesting uh, title. Now, in the, on the dust cover in the front, you've got some very useful uh, information uh, there about what's actually contained in the book itself and then on the back you've got a little bit of information about James Wilson uh, himself uh, which is extremely helpful and um, I'll explain a bit more about him in, in a few minutes. Now the book is only a short book, uh, 200, just over 200 odd pages, nice sort of cases mentioned which I rather like, I'm going to mention a few. All the usual suspects are here from the Rolling stone woods, uh, Stones upwards, if I can put it that way. Um, and, in fact, the important point to bear in mind in the index is it's very contemporary in the sort of subject matter he's dealing with. Um, there's a final word. This book has given 50 examples of the law in action over a time period exceeding a century. Um, and he hopes that it's a, a fit-for-purpose book. Um, he's also mentioning a lot of other things. There are, in fact, some quite useful little footnotes from time to time in the book itself. Uh, which I think is bad. And he does in fact mention um, the book that I reviewed some time ago now uh, by Graham Wil Williams, Queen's Council, late Graham Williams, Queen's Council, on a short book of bad judges, talking about um, wanting to have a longer book of bad barristers. Now that's a very interesting uh, point, and I hope Wilders will bear that one in mind. Now there's the front page, and then we've got after that a very nice dedication, which I'll show you there. And then after that, you've got the content section. And it runs through quite a lot. Uh, there are um, 12 parts, if you like, or chapters in total uh, to it. Obviously, the snails and ginger beer, <laughs> all the usual suspects are here, I hasten to add. There's the acknowledgement section there, and then a preface um, leading into it. It's very well written, this book. I, I found it very easy to read as well. I mean, for instance, he starts off Victoriana. Mention of the Victorian era conjures up much rich and often contrasting imagery. Dickensian poverty alongside magnificent Gothic revival public buildings. Then he sort of runs on. I wouldn't say it's Purple Patch at all. What I would say is that I think it's very well written. and I did like the way he did it. Now, this is what I say of the book, because I've taken some of the comments that have been made and, and sort of expanded on them a bit. It's only a short book in 12 parts, but every part of it's well worth reading for the insights it offers uh, into the common law as we have it today. And I think anybody who's a student of common law, likes law, loves law, will find this book actually something you want to read. Now, he's a New Zealander, is James Wilson. He comes to his legal task with the same relish and intentions as he did with his previous work, Court and Bold, which sort of is, is haunting this book because of the comments on the back. But his books do make a good read. Wilson presents us here with his second book of short essays on law stories and in writing in the preface he says he looks at a broad range of cases or other legal dilemmas that have caught his attention over nearly a thousand years of the common law and there have been no shortage, uh, there's been no shortage of material. Law students of course would agree. Now I'm going to make some comments on that because throughout uh, there's a wonderful wealth of uh, information, quirky cases, all sorts of things. And every person has their own quirky case that they like, or their own particular favourite. I know I have mine, I'm not telling you what they are. But I, I would say that the uh, certainly with this book, 
uh, again, he opens up a lovely little world. And if you can stand aside and just read it, it's a good read. So what he's doing is he's, Wilson poses the best question of all for us. Why are court cases such a fertile source for writers of fiction and non-fiction alike? And the answer is that they usually have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, now that would sound the obvious, but in fact that is what happens. They also have a ready cast of characters playing defined roles. Counsel will be pleased, of course, to hear that. And then Wilson goes on to say that such characters always have an inherent crisis to be resolved and also contain a great deal of human interest behind what he describes as, quote, the theatrics and etiquette of the courtroom and the often arcane language and concepts of the law. There are real people seeking answers to real life problems. And I think that's beautifully expressed. Remember that we are dealing with people who have got a really big problem and we're going to try and deal with it. Deal with it. And that's really where the business of the crisis comes in, because it is about the crisis for the individual concern. And that's what you as a lawyer are there to do, to try to help them. Let me continue. The common law <coughs> is sometimes described as being made by faceless corporations or rich and powerful individuals seeking to preserve their money and reputation, and all reputation, perhaps. And that criticism, of course, resurfaced recently, uh, certainly with the demise of legal aid as, as we used to know it, and a number of other factors. Just as often, however, as a balance, it is made by ordinary people, of course, the common law, who are not seeking fame or wealth, but who are simply trying to right whatever they believe has been wronged to them, or there's a problem. In other words, they're coming to me because they've got a problem, they're in trouble, or they want something. They want a court order. So you see basically where we're coming from. Now, Wilson's collection has <clears throat> 50 stories of notable court cases covering more than a century of legal history. And we've had a few books like this, which um, um, are on the market. This one is small. It's not very expensive. It's a lovely little read. And it's just the sort of thing for a train journey, apart from anything else. Um, there are, of course, the great ethical dilemmas. And that desperate and tragic hard case of the conjoined twins, where one, but not both, could survive. Now you see we're now dealing with the very serious issues. Another important vignette concerns the football fan Tony Bland who is left in a persist, uh, persistent vegetative uh, state after the Hillsborough disaster. We will be getting some results on that very shortly. I'm recording this first day of February 2016 and we'll be knowing a bit more about that shortly. Then you've got with Tony Bland the family who faced the tragic um, his tragic uh, choice of ending treatment. So these are very important matters which one has to think about and that's why the lawyers have a big role to play in this. We also have to handle the clients and I think that's an important point within the common law which one must understand. Yes this is the common law for you and why we as we are the lawyers are uh, dealing with such difficulties. The training comes into it but it's, it's certainly, I mean, with doctors, it's called the bedside manner, um, <clears throat> the courtside manner, whatever you want to call it. You've got to have a certain empathy with the client. I think that's very important today. And, of course, there are the great legal cases, such as Donahue and Stevenson and Louisa Carlyle's case, which I adore. We have the ridiculous and the disgraceful Victorian scandals, such as Oscar Wilde's fall from high society and his destruction and the wrongful imprisonment of Captain Dreyfus. Then there are the more topical cases, such as those involving religion and the law and the clash of rights that sometimes occurs when devout people find their consciences will not allow them to act according to the law. Yes, they're all there. I mean, I'm thinking perhaps there you could think of things, even very recently, very religious people not wanting same-sex couples or homosexuals to um, have a room in their boarding house. And you can see the issues, you can see the ethical arguments, the moral arguments, and then the legal arguments. And you see and remember the basic principle we've always had in the common law, which I like to remind people of, and that is today's dissenting judgment is tomorrow's good law. And I have to say, it does happen that way quite often. Let me conclude by saying a couple of things, and that is there are... The cases that can only be described, of course, as absurd, which are listed here. The writer Julie Birchall was once sued by a litigant who was offended by her describing him ugly. 
in another matter, an unfortunate marital dispute required the judge to look at reams of hardcore pornography and to try to find judicially appropriate neutral language to describe it. That's an area we do have a, a few <coughs> responsibilities with, um, and it's one area we don't really want to talk too much about. And frankly, I think the less said about a lot of that, the better, including the media. Finally, let me say that this book, I think, which you gather I love, I think it's a splendid book. It's written with an accessible style. It's exciting. It has an eye to the human as much as the legal interest all the way through. And it, <clears throat> Wilson's collection, I think, will be of interest to lawyers and non-lawyers alike. And is an excellent addition to um, our bookshelves. So thank you very much for doing it. And we'll look forward to your new books. Possibly one on a short book of Bad Barristers, which I mentioned right at the which is actually pointed out right at the end. So I think I'll give you a little bit of publicity for that. Let me open it up in the middle because um, religion and foster parents, a big one, always a difficult one. I'm just dealing with a case similar to that and dealing with particular matters at the moment. Employment law covered. Always very emotive. Um, harassment and his holiness. So there's a little bit of flippancy, but I did like snails and ginger beer because it doesn't really go, it does talk about the facts, but it doesn't actually say, look, um, there wasn't a snail in the first place. It mentions Matthew Chapman's book, The Snail and the Ginger Beer, which was excellent, of course, but there wasn't a snail. That just about sums up one of the problems with the common law. There's the front of the book, again, there's the spine. And then there's the back. Thank you to James Wilson. Thank you very much to Wildy, Simmons and Hill. Uh, Brian Hill, I'm very grateful to you for producing this. It's a first class book and do get it. It's, it makes a good Christmas present as part, part of anything else. So do bear that in mind. But thank you to all concerned and keep going with these books because they bring the law alive to all of us. Thank you. Bye bye.